welcome everyone out to uh, our little teaching summit today, and uh, it's quite the privilege that we have Craig Hockle being able to uh, join us today. I mean, especially with such an intimate little group, Todd Brinkman and I were just ch chatting about it. It's like, anytime we come listen to you, plus with this small of a group, I'm sure you can have some good, I, I'm not, I don't know if you do this, but Q&A, I would imagine yeah. this is going to be, you know, this will be good that we can do that. And, Craig definitely has the pedigree and the background as far as teaching goes. Um, he was our teacher of the year in 2020. I believe it was 2014 14. that you were in uh, Southwest section. Uh, but the other thing that's, uh, I think, is something that separates him a little bit from maybe other teachers, is he's a really good player. And so I think that that uh, is something that's very important, very important for all of our games, your games, and then your students too, kind of getting a little feel of out on the golf course. Um, you've got your uh, different training aids, Sabre Golf, I believe is what it is, that uh, Craig has created, and lots of different stuff. I love seeing training aids. I love seeing drills. I love seeing things that uh, can help us teach better and be better teachers. So, Craig, I don't know if I missed anything, but I'm sure we're going to get uh, a lot of knowledge over the next few hours. So thanks so much again yeah, for doing it. Yeah, thank you. Yep. I appreciate you insulting all of these other teachers that are bad players. <laughs> oh, we have all the best players in here. Uh, that's and, good. That might be a little something that, that they knew you were doing it. So and, that's uh, and all very good teachers, too. So, well, um, thank you, uh, Devin. Um, obviously, it's a privilege anytime you get to speak to any kind of a group, um, especially your peers. Can uh, it, It's always exciting for me to just be able to share, be able to help. I'm here to help, right? So if I can help in any way, that's my goal today. A couple things. Um, originally, you know, I, I kind of created this whole PowerPoint presentation on you know, theories and all that kind of stuff, which we can get into. But what I've decided to do, since it's a little bit smaller group and everybody in here is a really good teacher and good player, we're gonna kind of workshop this a little bit, have a little bit more interaction. So did everybody get a packet already? Okay, good deal. So in your packet, <clears throat> we're just gonna jump right into it. Um, I don't think I need to expand any more on, uh, on who I am and what I do. I'm here to help you, it's more about you guys. So that first slide right here is gonna be, let's be students, right? So I want you to put your minds in the mindset of a student, not in the mindset of a teacher. Okay, you all paid money to come and listen to me speak. The question is, are you gonna actually get the value out of it, right? So take a look at the next slide there. So this is where it's gonna get a little bit interactive. So <clears throat> you're gonna start this on your own, and then my goal is to actually split everybody up and kind of have conversations together. What we'll probably end up doing is switching the chairs around so you can sit face to face and we'll just kind of line everybody up. So we got five, six, it's gonna work out perfectly. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna end up splitting into groups of two, kind of having conversations together, right? But I don't want you to sit with your coworkers or your brothers or we're gonna split you guys up, okay? So the first question is if you were paying X, whatever that amount of money is for a lesson with me, right? So think about you're the student, I'm the coach. That X dollar amount, I want you to put your dollar amount. Whatever you currently charge for a lesson, I want you to write that in there. Um, and then in this space, we, we won't take a ton of time, but in this space, I want you to list <clears throat> all the things that you'd like to get out of the lesson to make you feel like it was worth it, right? So if you're paying me $300 for an hour, what do you want to get out of it? Right, then, and I want you to actually think about this from your real, true, honest perspective. Right? We all have probably played golf recently. Think about that last round of golf. Think about that time you know, that you hit a shot or a putt or your club fitting question or whatever it is. Think about your round. And just jot down some things specifically to you as a student. If you were paying me this, this amount of money, whatever that is, what do you want to get out of it? All right, so we'll just take a minute. You guys can grab that pen and paper and just jot some stuff down because as we go, we're gonna take time to kind of make it interactive. So jot down some notes. Does anybody need a pen?
it can be a couple simple words. It's mm -hmm. only, you're only going to see this part, but it's just maybe a couple of ideas pop into your head. You know, um, you may have missed a putt, you may have chunked a chip, you may have missed an iron shot, your flex in the driver shaft, you know, may not feel like it's quite right or whatever, something along those lines, but make it personal to you and something that you would actually like to do better at. So the purpose of this is obviously to put yourself in the place of the student. You know, I don't think we, I don't think we really do that enough as teachers, right? So that's why I'm kind of spearheading this, making, making us think a little bit differently about our role. We're always on the other side. You know, we're always behind the T-line while the student's on the T-line hitting shots or pots. And so, how's everybody doing? Got a couple notes in there? We're gonna add more to it on the next page, so. <clears throat> I'll give you another few seconds here. While I do that, I, I will tell you just a little bit. I fortunately just got back from the, the National Club Pro Championship in Austin. So that particular tournament for me, obviously a National Club Pro Championship is something that I really focus hard on every year. And it's that type of an environment that spurs me to take my teacher hat off and put my student hat on. Like, what, do I, what do I want to learn from it? What did that tournament and that environment and the shots that I hit, the experiences that I have, what did that inspire me to get better? Right, so that's just a way you can kind of look at that as well. Um, I think anytime you filter your thoughts through pressure, right? If you put yourself in the most pressure packed situation, um, I got to two under on the final round and I was basically within one stroke of finishing in that top 20. And I'm out on, you know, one of the holes. It was like my, probably my 14th, 13th, 14th hole somewhere in there. And I'm at two under on a really, really tough day. And I've jumped up probably at that point. I didn't look at the number. I jumped up probably 40 spots in that round. And then all of a sudden the TV cameras show up. So when a camera shows up, you kind of know you're doing something good. But that doesn't make it more comfortable for you, right? So all of a sudden I've reached a par five and two. I'm just off the side of the green. I chip my ball. It was a really tricky chip. Chip it up. There was a hole there where there's a, just a huge rock face wall in front. And I just, I hit my drive down there on hard pan and I had to hit a three wood and like pick it clean off of this dirt patch and manage to get it in the right side of the green. Then I see the camera show up. They park on the back of the green. Now I've got to hit this delicate little chip. I chip it to the high side. So now I've got a downhill. Don't know really if it's breaking right to left, left to right or straight but it's fast, super fast. And I've got to get up there with the cameras on me and make the putt. I make the putt, they all rush off to the next tee. I walk up the hill, get to the next tee and sure enough, camera's on me again. And I know they're following me because the guy in the camera, he's propped up his camera. And while the other guys are hitting, he's on his phone like this. <laughs> so then I hit a shot down the middle of the fairway. I'm a little bit more excited because I think, okay, if they're out here, I'm not looking at the leaderboard. If they're out here, I must be doing something good. <clears throat> Straight down wind, but I got to hit a nine iron from 170 yards up a hill, but I know it's down wind. So I'm trying to factor all that in. I fly it to the back edge of the green and it bounces over the green and now I'm on an upslope. They film all that and then leave because they probably know he's probably not gonna get up and down from the back of that green, which I hit a great flop shot to about eight feet, miss it, bogey. Get on the next hole, good drive, miss the green left, chip it to about eight feet, miss it. So now I go from two under to even par. By that time, the cameras have said, bye, we're out of here. <laughs> Right? Nonetheless, even par on that final day jumped me up 22 spots. I basically missed the top 20 by a full three strokes, but I had it to within one with a few holes to go. So anyway, that's the filter that should be pushing you. So I see familiar faces in here from playing golf even yesterday in our team match play. That's the kind of stuff you're thinking of if it's fresh, right? All right, so next page, right? So now we get a little deeper. <clears throat> now you have to ask, your, ask yourself a question, why do you want to achieve that? Mm -hmm. right? So you've identified a problem, you've put it up there, you've said, okay, I think this is a problem. 
Well, there's got to be a why. There's got to be a reason why you're trying to fix it, right? So just make some make a list of things in here. The reasons why you chose that, right? So in my case, I left Austin knowing that my standard chipping was pretty good, but my tough chipping was not very good. Uh, fortunately, yesterday um, I was able to make a, a really nice flop shot on the back of hole number nine and get up and down. That was really hard for me because my really tough short game shots were gone. And that's unfortunately what I was faced with a lot in Austin was just all these crazy chip shots because you're just trying to not hit a ball in the penalty area. The, the ground could be super firm, a little bit bare. You've got some Bermuda in there, you got some rye grass, and it was just really difficult once you put yourself in that. So jot down those reasons why. Like why do you think it's important to improve that one thing on the first page. So the first page was, I came to Craig to learn this, right? What is it? This is what I want to learn. And then the next page is why. Like, why do I want to learn it? Is it going to make me more money in the next tournament? It's going to save me more, you know, less stress. Okay. So then the next page, right? So there's a why. Then the next page, so go ahead and flip your, uh, your page over there. And then the, 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 the next question, is that it, right? Is that really it? Is that the, is that the one thing that you really want to improve on? Now you've established why you want to improve it. Now what I want you to do is take a quick little minute and jot down some goals. So list out the goals that you have for your game in this manner, right? So we're going to think about the immediate summer, summer of 2022. You came to me for a lesson. Mm -hmm. You're expecting to get this out of the lesson. The reason why you've written down. Now, just jot down a quick goal. 2022. The reason why I want to do this is because, and you may not, this, the, the previous answer may not have been goal related, so that's why this is goal related. So jot down a, a goal for you. And then look at the year end 2022. Then project out a couple years, 2024, by the end of 2030. We don't have to go there today, but this is kind of a good process for you to go through because, <clears throat> believe it or not, some, a small percentage of your students are actually kind of doing this. They're not really writing it down, but they're coming to you as a teacher, and they've already got all this figured out, haven't they? Right? A lot of times they've come to you, they've said, okay, I just retired from my executive job. Now I've got one year. I was gifted these great Callaway clubs as a retirement gift, and my goal is to get from here to here. I've got one year to do it, and then we're going to go on a year vacation and travel around the world. Right? That may not be realistic for everybody's students, but that's just an example of, right? People have thought through this, and that's why, as a student, I'm asking you to think through this. So jot down a couple of those goals in there. Does anybody have any thoughts or questions they want to just add while, if you've already written something down? Has anybody recently done this on their own? Kind of gone through that, Bruce done that? I think if you don't have a focus and a direction, something else will have your focus and your direction, right? So that's my, one of my goals of this particular session is to help you all as players play better with your own game. And then the stuff that you garner from that, you can then just transfer that right along to your students and teach better. So if you're not being specific with your focus and your time and your energy, something else is gonna distract you because there's plenty of distractions out there, right? All of a sudden, you haven't written any of this stuff down, all of a sudden you're flipping through Instagram and you see the swing move of the week, and then you're like, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll just do that. Maybe that'll, you know? Maybe that'll help me. Or you flip on to Craig Hocknell Golf YouTube channel and you're like, I'm just gonna watch all of Craig's videos. I'm gonna binge watch all 434 videos and then I'm gonna be better, all right? Which is Mike Bender the last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, up the wall. I watched I watched it all too. All right, so very good. Okay, now, next one. 
flip your page. <clears throat> Okay, now I want you to think about how much time and effort is required to, to kind of accomplish those things that you wrote down, right? Think about what you want to achieve and how much time, effort, and money it would take to achieve your longer term goals. How many lessons do you think it would take to achieve just your summer goal, just your summer goal? So you got your long term goal, throw a number in there, it's gonna cost me $1.5 million <laughs> to achieve all of my long term goals, you know, whatever that is. And then think about your most recent, your 2022 goal. Just like how many lessons do you think it would, would take? Like if you said, Craig, I need your help with this. Putting's kind of an expertise of mine, so I need your help with putting. Just think about oh, if I was to get really where I wanted to go for summer 2022, how many hours, how many lessons do I think it would actually take Craig to get me better to achieve my goal, right? So it's just kind of a a thought there and the first one is just it just in general like I've got these long-term goals for two years from now you know eight years from now what am I going to actually accomplish and how much money and time and effort do you think it's going to take me to do that because I think correct me if I'm wrong but I don't think we think about it like this do we <clears throat> right who, who just raise your hand um, if you only started, and this is going to be a little silly at the beginning, but if you only started playing golf five years ago, right? Ten years ago. Twenty years ago. Twenty-five years ago. Thirty years ago. Thirty-five years ago. Right? Forty years ago. Forty-five years ago. 42 years ago, 50 years ago. <laughs> 46. 46, okay. So in that period of time, whatever it is for you, how much of that time were you a student versus a teacher, if you, if you look at it? Um, and how many lessons have you taken in the last five years, right? So I think sometimes when we're in, we're on that side of the lesson T and we're teaching someone to do all of this, there's nothing wrong with it at all for us to be the expert. We are the expert, that's why they're here. We've garnered all this knowledge and information over that period of time, but I think sometimes we just forget what it feels like to be there. Now, you may have gone and gotten a lesson recently, which I give you credit for. You may have gone and sat with someone and, and had them help you. And if you haven't, I would encourage you to do that. And not even, you don't need to necessarily you know, I know one of our peers recently went out to California and spent some time with uh, George Gankus, right? So you don't necessarily have to fly out and talk to Mike Bender or, or whoever it is, right? Um, but get a lesson from someone on your team, right? One of the things I try to do at Glenwild is I've set up an instructor training program for our apprentices and our, our associate members, right? And our interns that are coming in. So what I do every summer is just basically just a summer program for the interns and then a year-long program for the assistants. I have to go watch them and they have to come watch me. And I used to say, oh yeah, just come on out. You know, come on out, watch me whenever you want. And that didn't happen because we're all busy, right? The last thing you want to do as an assistant is spend all day in the shop or help run a tournament or whatever it is and then go find Craig at the end of the day and watch. Or you're tired, you want to go home. So what I started doing is I started looking at their schedule and saying, hey, look, I see on the schedule that you're open here. I'm going to come watch you teach just to be more purposeful with that. And then one thing that I try to do as a coach is I try to coach my assistants on their games, right? Arter Hughes is one of our assistants, and he's my partner in the team event. And the reason why we're partners together is because I want to help him and coach him. So just over the last winter, he's probably picked up 20, 30 yards on his driver. He's probably picked up a full club to club and a half on his irons. His putting is much better. And so now he's super excited. We, you know, after the match play, we drove home together and he couldn't tell me how excited he was. Not just that I was helping him make cash a check in a, in a section event for one of the first times ever, but He's excited about his game and he's going to play better. And that, that goes for Mark Valenti as well. We've been working hard on his game. And, 
and he waved at me on the range yesterday before we teed off and he's like look because <laughs> if anybody's ever played with mark he gets this or he had this right and he bombs it but he if he played a tree line course like if this is a fairway right here he clipped the branches off of that tree and then it would land on this side of the green over here right but now he's figuring out how to play like a little bit of a push fade so that's exciting for me so put yourself in that student mindset all right okay next page <clears throat> okay so how would you feel this is a feeling thing now how would you feel uh, <clears throat> if these things happen right you learn more than you wanted and are amazed at the results. So thinking through the last page, you're like, okay, 2022 summer goals, I think it's gonna take me five lessons to get this thing fixed. And then the first one, you're like, hey, Craig knocked it out in one lesson, right? You're, you're completely amazed. Not only did he reveal to you that this is the exact fix and then you're done and you're on your way, but he also revealed these other things that I wasn't even looking for. Like, how would you feel? Just put a, a feeling word down in there. It's all probably gonna be the same, like excited, mind blown, right? Go ahead and jot that down in there. Next one. So how would you feel if you learned exactly what you wanted to learn in the lesson, right? So you came asking for this and you got exactly that. Like what's a feeling that you would put in there? Uh, next one, you learn some good things, but not exactly what you wanted to learn, right? Or, or fix, you, you, you came, you learned some good things, but it was like, eh, I really came for this and didn't quite get it, right? Close, but good, good things, but not exactly what I wanted. Next thing, you learn none of what you wanted to learn. You came to my lesson, you're like, that guy, he just talked, he told stories the whole time and I walked away and I was like, what a waste of money. Like I didn't learn anything at all, right? So how would you feel? These are feelings. And then, uh, and then what you learned in the lesson made you frustrated and worse off, right? So not only did you come to the lesson, but you left like, oh, this is now I'm hitting it even worse. This is the worst thing I've ever experienced. Like how would you feel in that situation? So you can kind of see where I'm going with this. We've all had these things happen as teachers, right? As a teacher, put your teacher hat on now. Every single one of these has happened to us. We've stood there and given just an amazing lesson and the student's like, wow, I can't believe it. You're amazing as a coach. And then we've had the bottom one where, where even we are like, eh. Like, mm, probably need to give you your money back or help you find a different coach or Maybe I need to leave the state or you need to leave the state, <laughs> right? There's, some, there's something going on in there. And, and, and those, are, <clears throat> those are very few and far between and they're maybe more in the past than the present, but we can all think back to, you know, at least one time in our lives um, where, where that's happened. All right, so next page. All right. Now we're gonna be coaches. So in this exercise, what I wanna do, and we'll just kinda of use this space right here, <clears throat> I think this could kind of work. So I'm gonna split you right here in this spot. <clears throat> and then if you wanna just take your chair and just sit in front of Terry at the end and so on and just face each other. And just kind of, you don't have to get, you know, don't have to get super close, but at least we're not wearing masks right now. So yeah, move your chair, introduce yourself, meet a new person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, yep. And you can spread out, you can move your chairs apart. Spread out a little bit. Yeah, one more here. Alright. Yeah, I'll give you a second. Just introduce yourselves.
All right, so now flip it to that question after it's uh, how to be coaches. Flip it to that next page. How do you give the student what they want? Work with your partner on their summer 2022 goal and come up with a few simple sentences on what you believe needs to happen to achieve the goal at hand, okay? So share the 2022 summer goal with that person opposite you. And uh, well, the way we'll do this is we'll just split it in half. So you guys on this back row, you share first, okay? On this side, share your goal. And then if you're on this side, write down on the paper your answer of how you're gonna fix or help them with their goal. And then once you're done, you can flip it back the other way. All right, go for it. <laughs> I figured if I could get a bunch of teachers to talk, it, it, we could be here all day. Right? <laughs> But um, what I could sense from the group was that everybody was engaged and everybody actually cared, right? Yeah. Like when someone comes to you as a person, right? And then as a teacher, as a coach, and says, hey, I've got a problem, can you help me? You're all in, right? I mean, that's how we are. That's why we do what we do. And that's why we love this game because we feel like we can get little pieces of information, pass it along, help the next person. So when you look at this, right, let's be coaches. What is the number one thing? Right, what's the number one objective of any lesson? Give the student what they want, right? Now, sometimes they don't know exactly what they want, or they came to you for something. Like, I love it when someone says, I'm fine with distance, my accuracy is bad. Right, they're like, oh, I hit the ball plenty far enough, but I, I just need some more accuracy. And I always tell them, sorry, you're out of luck, because if I fix your accuracy, you're gonna hit it further. <laughs> so I don't know where we go from here, you know? Sorry, <laughs> can't help you today. <laughs> if all you want is accuracy, can't do it. So I always think of it, the number one thing you wanna do is like ask your students what they want and then figure out how to give it to them, right? If you go back to the feelings page and you're like, oh, I went to the lesson, I wanted this and I got this, those are great words that everybody wrote down, right? Let's jump back a couple pages on that sheet and just look at that. So how, how would you feel, right? Let's look at that, let's, let, let's just shout it out. We're, We've got our um, vocal cords warmed up already. Throw a word out there. If you've got more, you were amazed, you just spent time with a coach, right? So we've already maybe checked off one of those goals for the summer. If you were partway thinking in your head through my presentation that, hey, you know what, Craig's right, I need to be a student and I need to go get a lesson. You just did it. Right? How many of you have given lessons over the phone, via phone call, text, FaceTime, Facebook, whatever, right? Raise your hand, I wanna see. Like if you've actually given a lesson to somebody without standing there and watching them hit. That's a lesson, right? Now if you wanna bill it as uh, hours billable like a lawyer and send them a bill, you can do that, right? Or you can just, you know, keep it as a little back pocket credit just in case you happen to go over 10 minutes on one lesson and you short that person 10 minutes you're like yeah I gave you 17 texts last night at midnight you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay so what's a word pumped. I'd be pumped. pumped what else motivated motivated excited excited right so if, if you just sat there across from each other, okay, and we don't need to out somebody if they just gave you horrible advice, <laughs> uh, but who felt, you know, I want to hear something from you all, who felt something good from that conversation? Just tell me, you can praise the person that worked with you. Hey, I think that information was really good. Who wants to go first? Because I'm going to ask everybody. So I was talking about my putting a little bit. Okay. Something that it's more of a mentality that I need to have than 
really technique. So Aaron was telling me about how his daughter went online, designed her own putter, designed everything, kind of got it, and all of a sudden she's making everything, right? So, yeah. So for me, it kind of gives me the, you know, is it, I need to be able to have what I want mm-hmm. and have that comfortability with what I'm looking at. And that could be one of those things that help me get past the mental block. Right? Yeah, no, that's a great piece of advice, yeah. right? And I know that from my own experience. I make my own putters. Right. Yeah. And I go through that exact same experience with my students. They get to pick the color. They, get, they don't get to pick the length, the why, the way. I pick that for them. But they get to laser engrave a picture of their dog or their company logo on the bottom of the putter, and they pay $1,000 for the putter, so you're gonna pay more for that customization, so what does that do to you as a player? You're all in, right? If you got a picture of your kid on the bottom of your putter, right, and your favorite colors are blue and gold, and you just did that, it's not going in the closet next time you have a couple three wiggles, right? You're like, I spent a thousand dollars on this. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. I won't speak for everybody, but <laughs> there's a higher probability that you'll keep it in the round for one or two more, especially if you paid a lot of money and you got really good coaching advice. You're going to start not blaming the club as quickly as you might just blame, hey, you know what? I just don't own that process good enough yet. All right. Who, who else wants to go? Who, who got some, a good little tidbit of information from their coach? Aaron, what'd you learn? Me, Aaron? This Aaron? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so he already Steve gave advice. Me, Steve was telling me about this uh, app called Decade Golf, which oh, basically yeah. when you play crash rock, rock times or tournaments, you figure out where the exact aim point is to where you have a shot into the green based on what your misses are. Mm-hmm. Also, talk about more in depth. Uh, stats keeping, um, like I do just fairways miss or not, but like fairways miss left, miss right, greens over long, just kind of getting more mm-hmm. in depth of your own game kind of way. So definitely some things I can do better on that sort. Yeah. Yeah, data capture is important. Proper data capture is important, right? Yeah. I can tell you rounds where I've purposely tried to not hit the fairway. But if I was trying to keep track of my fairways hit, that's not a good good enough stat, right? right. I keep track of my my dispersion cone, right? right? So that's good information. Ryan, what'd you what'd you learn? Uh, putting, just breaking it up into increments, not just sitting out there for an hour and then getting punched with the breakdown mentally. Mm. Mm-hmm. Like like distance increments or different no, things just like time, increments. time. Going out for 10, 15 minutes at a time, not just standing on the putting green and missing and then getting mad at yourself. There you go. There you go. All right, so time management, I think that might have been on everybody's list at some point, right? If you're not owning your time and, and, and scheduling your time, somebody else is gonna steal your time. It's super, super important. Someone, something is gonna steal your time, right? I, I can't tell you how many times I've come in, I'm like, I've got an hour, I've gotta punch in these club orders, I've gotta eat some lunch, and I walk through the shop and then I'm in the middle of like giving a swing tip like right by the Peter Millar shirts, <laughs> right? Like I have to be able to say, hey, you know what? Sorry, or if I see that person just run the other way. Because <clears throat> time, t- our time is valuable and our time is super important. I can't tell you how many times as a young golf pro I'd, be, I'd get on my flip phone or I'd dial it from the shop because that was before cellular phones. But I would call my wife and I'd be like, hey, I'm gonna be done in 10 minutes. I'll be home in 30. And then what happens? Nope. <laughs> never, never. So a quick marriage tip, tell your wife or husband, I'll be home in an hour. And then when you show up in 30 minutes, that's better than telling them you'll be home in 10 minutes and showing up in an hour, right? Um, who else has got a great tip? Yep. I got some great advice from Joe, who I've looked up to. We're about the same age since the junior golf days. And about four years ago, I destroyed my lower back. Mm. I used to run a lot. Mm. Um, Four years into physical therapy and emptying my wallet, because everybody says they can fix it without surgery, I'm probably worse now and probably need to have some. But anyway, 
I'm still, I still love to play, but as my skills have declined because of my physical condition, I've gotten to the point where I'm so embarrassed I don't even want to go out and play in a section event, and I miss that. Mm -hmm. So I've chased, I've gone down a lot of rabbit holes trying to fix it myself, and Joe just says, hey, we, you need to see if you, the things you're working on, you need a physical analysis to make sure you can actually do those things. So mm -hmm. we talked about, you know, uh, John Rhodes and TPI and just some of those things, because I think some of the things I've been trying to do to work around my hip problem has actually mm -hmm. got me to a point where I'm a little worse. Yeah. I'm committed. So yeah. I, I still want to get better. And if I have to have surgery to fix it, I'll fix it. Right. That's awesome. Like, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Right? And then if you ask some questions, dig a little deeper and ask other people. I mean, that's why we're doing this. Is that you, you, you don't know what you don't know. Right? Um, <clears throat> I've had many students that have gone down that same road gone into, hey, I need to have this kind of surgery, that kind of surgery, and I'll say, nope, <clears throat> time out, let's change your swing, let's add length to your clubs, let's change the flex, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, not only am I three strokes better on average, but you know, I'm 20 grand richer because I didn't have to have that surgery. Like I've literally had people postpone and cancel their surgeries because everything we do in our daily life causes a repetitive stress injury, everything. Right? Who's noticed in the last five to ten years their pinky finger gets really sore because that's where they hold their bone? <laughs> right? Who's had biceps tendinitis? Who's had their who's had like a feeling like oh this is so tight right through the bicep, right through here? Because you're holding your phone. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Right? It doesn't weigh much, but if I stood here just with nothing in my hand for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is, and then I try to release my bicep, it's tight. Well, then you go do something like go hit a ball or something like that. You create a repetitive stress injury, bicep tendonitis, from holding your phone. So <coughs> switch phones, put your phone down, put it on something, swipe with your finger. Whose thumb is worn out? You know? I mean, this, this stuff happens to us. Uh, anybody else want to add? We'll do one more. Who, who got a great piece of information? Um, we just talked about just like the season of life. Like, mm. so now that, you know, my daughter's 11 and plays golf now, and my husband plays golf more now, like, it, you know, pushes me to now go take the time to practice mm -hmm. and work on the things that I, you know, I want to get better at my wedge game and be more creative. and master that flop shot that I've wanted to master my whole life. So, mm -hmm. you know, now that it's just a different season of life, yeah. we can go do that together. That's so. perfect. Yeah. The perspective, right? Because when you look at that season, you're like, okay, I'm actually excited about this season. But you know what? It's perfectly okay to not be excited. It's a season, right? A lot of us kind of freak out. Because we're like, oh, I've got this tournament coming up, or whatever it is. <clears throat> You're like, I used to be more competitive in the section championship, or whatever it is. And you're like, ah, oh, this sucks, I'm frustrated. It's a season. Let it pass. Do whatever you have to do, and then work through the season. So it works both ways. If you're going into a motivating season, got more time, got more money, got more people to do it with, Great, that's a fun season. The other season, you know what? I can't play in enough tournaments because I gotta make more money, I gotta work harder at this point. This is my season. Right? Take it for what it is. It's just a season and it'll pass. Right? So you can you can do that. So let's look at um, the kind this is kind of leading us into the next part. So we go past the coaches now. The next slide that we're going to look at is uh, where do you focus your efforts? Okay, just take a look at that. So you got a, you got some advice. Now you're looking at where do you focus your efforts, right? So we had one of an app building a putter. We had one that's specifically equipment related. We had one that's an app that's related to stat tracking. Right? So in this case, it's equipment. In this case, it's golf IQ. Right? I want to get faster. Then we had body. 
We had a physical part of that. Then we had time, more of like a freedom of, of confidence, but also skill development, the flop shot, right? So now here's why we're going to talk about this, and this is one of the most important things that I basically discovered, and, and some of you may have discovered something similar, but it's categorizing your focus, right? If, I'm, if I get done playing my tournament, and I'm like, dang it, missed another cut, what the heck is wrong with me? Like, I've done this a bazillion times. I've hit that shot a million times, and it kind of ends up falling down, down, down into this bucket of, like, something mental, something confidence, whatever, right? Is it? If you really diced it up and chopped it up into categories, what percentage is your focus? So right here, I want you to write whatever that piece of advice is that you got, and not just the piece of advice you got, but maybe something you've heard. Um, your goal for summer 2022, write a percentage by each one of these. Try to make it out up to 100%. 100% total? Total. Total 100%, you have five <coughs> categories. <coughs> Give it, a, give it a percentage. Aaron just wrote 110, 110, 110, 110. <laughs> so I thought I did it right, and then I added it up, and I'm at 110. Oh, yeah. That's good. I'm a 110 kind of guy, too. <laughs> That's why we love you, Aaron. We're always giving an extra 10. Yep. <laughs> it's like my kids, they get mad at me because they're like, Dad, everything does not cost $1,000 because that's my line. I'm like, I'm like, dude, I spend a thousand dollars on shoes on you every year. They're like, no, you don't. I'm like, add it up. Like, what you know, whatever it is, just happens to be a thousand dollars. So now it's kind of a joke. Now it's a joke. They'll say something like, um, you know, you owe me a thousand dollars for whatever thousand dollars just happens to be the number. So for Aaron, it's a hundred, hundred and ten percent. All right, so let's go through this. We're going to start at Terry, and I'm just going to have you uh, start with equipment. Where, what percentage are you assigning to your focus for equipment? Zero. Zero. Perfect. Brian? 30. Aaron? Five. Aaron? Ten. You got your name? Equipment. <laughs> yeah, equipment. Equipment. Is everybody done? Everybody done? So just call it out down the line there. Five. I have five down here, but I've spent a lot of my time in the winter on my equipment. Okay. Bruce? Uh, ten. And I did mine in the winter, too. Five. Ten. Ten. Okay. Next. Next line. Technique? Twenty. Twenty? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Forty. Forty. Fifty. Twenty-five. Thirty. Thirty-five. Ten. Ten. Forty. Twenty. Twenty. Okay. Physical body? 50. 5. 40. 10. 20. 25. 20. 10. 45. 40. Okay. Oh, one more. 20. 20. Golf IQ. So let me clarify that real quick. That's just, you know, like Aaron was talking about the information he got from Steve was decade app. It's like, can I be a little smarter? Right? So that's why I like think about it as just how smart you are with the things. Do you know the difference between Paspalum and Bermuda and what are, you know, how does all that play into it? So. 20, 15, 10, 25, 10, 10, 10, 10 30, 5, 10, 40. Okay, confidence? 10, 25, 10, 5, 45, 30, 25, 50, 40, 10. Oh, sorry, uh, 20. 30. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we just had our couch session over there while you were chatting. Um, okay. Yes, sir. I think there's one missing here. What is it? Playing. Yeah. Yeah. I need to spend more time on the golf. Playing. Yeah, I would, as far as playing is concerned, <laughs> that's kind of more on like the skill development side, but the playing is the catalyst for these things. Yeah. So 100%, right? So you're gonna play, 
and you're going to play better. You're going to play more because you're going to organize it in these categories, right? So think about that time, that time management part. Can you carve out 30 minutes at the beginning or the end of the day? Can you carve out an hour at the beginning or the end of the day? Can you do that one day a week, two days a week? Can you just carve out an entire day? Take that day off, you know, two days off. In the winter time, can you carve out more of that time? Like a couple of the guys here mentioned there's a lot more emphasis and focus on equipment and whatnot, trying to get stuff dialed in, right? So it doesn't matter what the actual time factor is, it's just, this is now going to guide your focus, right? Because we, we all get this, like how many times you're thinking to yourself, all right, okay, I'm gonna go teach, or I'm gonna go do this, and then at the end of the day, I'm gonna go to the range, I'm gonna work on my short game. And then at the end of the day, you're on the, you can go out to the range, put your bag down, and then someone's like, let's go play a few holes. And you're like, eh, okay. Right? You gotta be able to say no. Like, sorry, I carved out this time for my short game. This is what I'm here to do. And I'll and let's put it on the calendar, we'll schedule it, and I'll get, you know, let's do it next week. Whatever that is, right? So, like I said, some something or somebody is going to steal your focus and your time. Don't let that happen. Just be intentional with that. And it's perfectly okay. Everybody in the whole world deals with this. So when somebody hears you say, no, you know what, I need to focus on this, okay? They, they could be shocked or offended, but they could also go, huh, that person's got their stuff together. They're intentional, they're focused, they're moving in the right direction. I wanna be more like that person. Then all of a sudden you'll start seeing people that you work with or in your circle, they're like, you know what, I see how that person he or she operates. I see how they go about their day. You know, and they fully, fully respect that you just told them no to their face, right? And it's not because you don't like them, but if you don't like them, this is a really good out, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you don't like them that much, you can be like, yeah, yeah, yeah I got my time allocated. Sorry, <laughs> right? Okay, very good. So, next slide. Okay, let's be friends. <clears throat> okay, so we're getting to know each other a little bit. I um, don't know everybody in this room, but collectively as a group of PGA professionals, we can help each other, can't we? Right? I mean, if there's a group of qualified individuals to help another golfer, we should be that person. Um, Again, we have our time to monitor, but how about we give each other some time? Like, wouldn't that be cool? Right? I'm more than willing to give you my time when I text you back and say, I'll call you tomorrow. Now you know my time's already allocated to something or someone or something else, but I will get back with you and I will help you. So we can do that. So take a look at the next slide, right? So what are the opportunities for success? From your own experience, tell us how you were able to fix a similar problem and achieve more success, okay? So <clears throat> one thing I know is that if I spout out theory from a, another source, right? From a book, from a whatever, if I spout out some theory, something that I picked up, there's probably a chance I'm gonna mess it up. There's probably a chance that I'm not gonna say the stack quite right or whatever it is, because it wasn't really mine, right? I'm just, I read it, heard it, borrowed it from someone else. What's happened in my life, you can't dispute, unless you were there, and now I'm just making stuff up. Right, the fish that I caught yesterday was like at least this big, right? Um, if you were there, then you can dispute it, but in reality, what is there to dispute? Who really cares, right? It's my life, I lived it, I did this thing, I did this, had this experience, and from this experience, that experience taught me this, and I was able to do this, 
right? I was able to get better. I was able to improve from something that happened to me and experience that I had. So a lot of times, um, our style of teaching, the things we say, the knowledge that we pass on was something that we learned along the way, right? When I played high school golf, I, my coach made me do this drill. So what do you do? You end up having your students do those same kind of drills. Um, maybe it was a, a professional tournament that you played in and the outcome was either good or bad and now you have a golfer that comes to you and you want to pass on, hey, you know what? Just like my story earlier about Austin, from my own personal experience, this is what I learned to be more successful, right? So, to that point, I want you all, as my peers and as PGA professionals, to experience things more, experience a process, experience a troubleshooting process, so that as you experience it on your own and you gain success from it, you can then pass that along to your students so that you can help them to do better, right? Um, does anybody have anything relative to kind of what this speaks to, maybe from the conversation that you just had or a recent tournament? Uh, Bruce was with me at the National Club Pro. Bruce, in your head, anything from that tournament and you're thinking through some of what we did here, but mostly from that experience, is there a nugget, like a golden nugget piece of information that you can share with the whole group? And you're like, you know what? I experienced this and now I know I'm gonna do this better. Anything? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm very hard on myself. Mm. I think people that have, if you've played a lot of golf with me, you can probably seen how frustrated I get when things aren't going kind of the way. You mean when you turn into like Wolverine? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this wasn't here. <laughs> <laughs> so, one thing, it was, I learned it from, not that I didn't know it, but it's like you relearn, you relearn, you relearn. Yeah. So my, my 17 year old son was caddying for me. Um, I played a great, not a great first round, but I ended really good. So I was, I shot 68 in the first round, was kind of in a good position, mm -hmm. felt like I'm playing really well. And the second round, I didn't start off very well. And so my shoulders started to hunch. I started to kind of whatever, and I, I get to this par five, which wasn't really reachable, it was into the wind. I hit a terrible layup shot. I shouldn't say terrible, it was fine. <laughs> you know, but I almost hit it in a fairway bunker 120 yards from the green. Mm. Like, that could have been bad, right? It could have been right. terrible. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of, not that I slammed my club, but I kind of knocked it down and I said out loud, I'm gonna shoot 100 today. Ah. So the next tee, my, my son goes, Dad, Get it together. <laughs> he goes, I can't believe you're letting this affect you like this. Yeah. You know, and it was more of a reminder of why is it affecting me this way? Yeah. I mean, it's, number one, it's because I care, but he's 100% correct. It's like, this shouldn't affect my shot. It shouldn't affect my attitude. So a lot of it was just an understanding that I need to be kinder to myself and kind of just Go with the flow, I guess, is, yeah. is more of what it was. That's a great perspective. My son caddying for me at um, the bayonet course a few years ago did the yeah. exact same thing. He was like, tap, tap, tap on the shoulder. <laughs> no, he literally like pulled me off the tee. And as a dad, I'm like, oh, this is gonna be good. <laughs> <laughs> I follow him over there and he's like, like poking me in the chest, like, Give me that look. Get it together. <laughs> Acting like an ass right now. Right? Like, because I was doing that kind of thing. Yeah. Joe, what do you think? What do you got? From the tournament? Yeah. Something that you're like, probably oh just, man. Probably just general, um, just from conversations with great players and my own experience. Like, sometimes we want to be an ideal. Like, let's say with the swing, like, if I can swing like Adam Scott, I'd be mm. good or whatever. And we, we spend a lot of time trying to be someone else when we probably need to look at how we can do the best with what we're doing you know so you can waste a lot of time trying to 
no one really likes their swing or what they do. They look out on film a lot of times. We're like, well, I can change this and this. And a lot of it's wasted time if we're not working with what we got. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna see if I can find this real quick. If I can't, we'll just uh, we'll skip on. But let's see here. Great opportunity for Alex here. For the rookie year. Heading into the weekend with a chance to maybe win your first PGA Tour event. First, let's talk about when you've done the first 36 holes. How would you describe how you've been playing so far? This week, pretty well. Uh, I felt like I played really well today. Didn't score as great on my first nine. I started on 10. Felt like I hit a lot of really good shots. Um, left myself in some weird places around some of the greens and didn't hit the best of the chip shots and made a couple of bogeys, but hung in there and made some birdies on the par fives. and. Took advantage of some of the scoreable holes on the front nine and had a shot from the fairway happen that happened to go in. So um, pretty stress-free today. Um, obviously the wind was blowing a little bit more than we had yesterday morning. Um, so that made the course play a little different. Um, but yeah, looking forward to, to the weekend and what that holds. What are you looking forward to, especially with a uh, top flight player like John Bond in the mix? I don't know if I have a whole lot of expectations. I mean, I. I know it's going to be a little different than what I'm used to, but um, it's funny, I, I played with John in college. He probably doesn't remember me, but I think he was a senior when I was a freshman. Um, so it was five or six years ago. Um, I'll have to ask him tomorrow and see if he remembers. But yeah, you know, I was, I think I was in the last group on Saturday in Punta Cana a month ago and felt like I learned a decent amount. So hopefully I can take that into, into tomorrow and learn some more tomorrow. And what did you learn from that moment? that you don't need to be perfect out here. You know, you just need to play solid and keep, uh, just plot your way around and not, you know, no one out here hits it exactly where they're looking all the time. So um, I feel like if I can realize that and obviously I have expectations of, you know, I want to hit it where I'm looking, but just realizing that it's not going to happen every single time um, and accepting that I think will be a big factor tomorrow. Uh, Wish you the best. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Anybody else have anything? that they, they want to share, that they've learned, or had an experience recently, Steve, yeah? This is more of a story, but I was living in Hillhead back in the late 80s, early 90s, and Davis Love had won the Heritage four times at that point, and so he is in the lead uh, for his fifth tournament title, and I decided I was going to watch him from the time he walked out of the locker room to the time he walked off the 18th green that day. Mm. Watched his whole entire practice session, I watched him play 18 holes, and I realized he, he won the tournament, he won it for the fifth time. He did not hit it anywhere near perfect that day. <laughs> he hit it in the trees probably six times, but was able to recover, and his wedge game was just impeccable. When he had a chance to make birdie, he made birdie. Yeah. And when he hit it in the trees and he'd lay up, you know, 30, 40 yards short of the green, he got up and down. Yeah. But it wasn't a perfect round by any means. And he goes out, and, you know, it was like 68. No big deal. Yeah. Uh, leading the tournament, so he did. He wasn't playing under any stress in that situation, but uh, it was really eye-opening. I mean, they don't hit perfect, even at the top of the game, in you know, in the lead and contention. Yeah, that's a great point. And when you actually watch somebody all the way, I mean, that's a great way to do it. Because you, you know, when you're sitting on your couch, typically you're just looking at the highlight reel. And you're like, ah, oh, they make every putt. Well, they, yeah, they do, because that's the only ones they show on TV, right? You, you don't have to be a genius to, to go, oh, uh, when the commentator says, and earlier, you're like sitting with a non-golf buddy, I bet you 100 bucks he makes this putt, <laughs> you know? Because it's a highlight reel, and that's why they're gonna show it, they're gonna bring it up to do that. But I've got a, I'll show you a video of, into a couple of those things when we get back from our, our little break that we're going to take here in a second. Let's just make sure that we are done. So as we as we finish up kind of this part of it, that's my motivation to you is, again, you don't know what you don't know. And someone, someone or something's going to steal your time. So if you're sitting there wondering, like, what do I need to do to actually improve? Be specific with those things. If you put 0% in one of those categories, you, 
just avoid it completely. I mean, I would say probably a little routine maintenance on that, on that category is not a bad thing. But if you're intentionally trying to accomplish a goal, be specific with exactly what it is that you think is gonna be the most important thing. I heard some bigger numbers, 50s, 45s. I don't know if anybody put any more than 50, except they haven't put 100. 110, I- 110. I Going once, 120, anybody got 120? I put 50 down because at my age, I have to work out every day and be healthy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that- I spend two hours doing Yeah, that physical part of it is yeah. very, very good point. Yeah. Right? We, we, we can't do this thing without our body, right? And we can't do it without our clubs, right? How far can I hit this ball? Right? It's not gonna go very far. I don't have a tool to use, right? We need clubs. And as we know, our mind, we can't really do it without our mind. And our mind really encompasses the confidence and the golf IQ part of it. So if you think about your equipment and your body and your mind, it's kind of it, right? But within those three things, I've broken it out into five things. So if you can take this trim five, and the reason why I call it, thanks Fritzing. The reason why I call it trim five is, is this basic thing that I just walked you through, is because there's five categories and you're gonna trim strokes out of each category. Okay, now the reason why I landed on this was because I was the frustrated player who didn't really know where to go. Like, where, where do I go? Where do I spend my time? Where do I focus my energy, right? And all I could see was this big elephant sitting on this platter that I had to eat. And I'm like, how do you eat an elephant? Like one bite at a time, right? So one day at a time, one moment at a time, one piece of the puzzle at a time. So, how do you decide where, you're, which rabbit trail you're going to go down? Okay, this is not a rabbit trail. This is a distinct focus on exactly what it is that you think is the most important thing on your priority list. And it does change. It can change. I wouldn't say necessarily from week to week, but it could change from month to month, or season to season, or whatever that is. It does evolve, and here's how this here's how this plays out. Terry said he's working on his body. He put fifty percent into that, right? Well, if if every morning you get up and it's like autopilot, I got this, boom, 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 do my stretches, do my workout, I got it. Maybe you don't need to spend as much focused energy on that because it's part of a routine. Then you can take some of that fifty percent of your focus and put it into something else. Right, let's say it's the equipment thing. And Bruce takes Aaron's advice, he goes on, he builds the best putter he's ever had in his life, and all of a sudden, the, the actual tool, a part of the equation, is now not part of the percentage. It drops, maybe it goes from 45 to 5% or whatever it is. Well then, because you're dealing with 100% of your focus, you just reassign it, right? Just reassign it into one of those categories so that as you reassign it, you start changing your priority list of what it is that you're gonna to wanna to do. Okay, so um, does everybody kind of understand exactly where that goes? So, quick question, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna break, and then when we come back from our break, I'm gonna pick maybe one or two or three of these main topics, and I'll just pull everybody, because I couldn't memorize everybody's percentages as we went around. Um, but if you want me to spend more time in the next session on equipment, raise your hand. Okay, if you want me to spend more time on technique, raise your hand. Keep your hand up, hi. Okay, that's most everybody. Uh, what about physical body? If you want me to spend more time talking about physical body, raise your hand. Golf IQ. And it, you can raise your hand twice if you want, because I'm gonna pick two or three of them. So golf IQ, okay, and confidence. Okay, so I'm gonna skip equipment and body, and I'll spend a little bit more time on the technique and the golf IQ and the confidence part of it, uh, which is cool, because it's really what I wanted to do anyway, because, you know, 
Like I'm not the Adonis standing up here with the, the physical body to just <laughs> display for everybody. Um, and then, uh, so here's what we'll do. How much time? 10, 10 minutes or so? Yeah, restroom? Say, uh, uh, maybe we say 10.45 when we back. That gives us about 12 to 15 minutes. Perfect. And then See. there's a, a few little items here, snacks that Darcy put up for us. And so there's, yeah, there's, so there's, you can get something out of the fridge, or there's fountain drinks, there's coffee, hot chocolate. So okay. All right. See you at 1045. All right. Cool. Everybody good? Good break. All right. So <clears throat> I'm going to have you just kind of go through this little exercise with me real quick. So everybody just put your hand up. Any hand doesn't really matter. Okay. So on the hand, there's those five categories, right? So if we think through what they are, we have, comp, we have uh, equipment. Okay, then we have technique, <laughs> we got physical body, golf IQ, and then confidence, right? And I like saying it that way, you know, for the confident fist, like the confidence kind of wraps everything up, right? So that's where we'll land at the end of this. Um, we're gonna talk about some fun stuff, some cool stuff when it comes to technique and and swing philosophy. Um, so that's kind of what we're gonna get into right now. But as you're kind of remembering where you're gonna prioritize your percentages of effort and energy, uh, it's easy, just kind of think about it through your hand right there. And, and um, like we said, Devin's 100% thumbs up, confidence for him. So, um, okay, my swing philosophy. Can you guys see it from there? Okay. Here's, this, is my, this is my priority list. And the way I kind of formulated this was based on what I felt like were like gears in a car, okay? So if I said you're gonna get in a manual transmission vehicle and you're at the light and you're gonna start your car, right? What gear, you're probably gonna be in neutral, you're gonna have the you're going to be sitting in the vehicle in neutral, right? Foot on the clutch, getting ready to move the accelerator. You're going to take that gear and you're probably going to put it into first, right? You can start in second, but usually you're going to start in first. So I think of what's the, what's the first thing that needs to operate? What's the first thing that needs to be moving in the golf swing? So I think of gear one. Right, gear one for me is hand action, just gripping forearms. So I think it's important for us to just kind of also take a big look at what golf is. Okay, so here it is, quickly defined. Take stick, whack ball in hole, right? Make ball go from point A to point B. Now, as we play the game, as we have beginner golfers, people want to say, I want to play golf. And you take them to the putting green and you put the ball down a foot from the hole and you have them put the ball into the hole. You just play golf. Hey, really? Right? That, that, that is golf. I picture some shepherds in in Scotland and they got their shepherd's crook and they're sitting around and they got, yep, still got the same 12 sheep. And then they take their shepherd's crook and they go over and they see a pebble or a rock and they go, Tink! and they just use the other side of their shepherd's crook and they knock that rock and it tumbles over here. And then their buddy walks up and they're like, hey, bet I can hit this rock closer to that tree than you, right? And then they're like, oh, let's not make it a tree. Let's dig a hole. So they dig out a hole, right? And then eventually they establish some type of a ball. They make something, right? That's golf. So playing golf for everybody is completely different. Whether you're playing in a PGA Championship or you're, or you're just learning for the first time, golf is taking stick, whacking ball to somewhere, right? Like I love like all the snag equipment, that kind of stuff. You take stick, you whack fluffy, ball and stick it to Velcro bullseye, right? That's golf. So when I think of what does it take to actually play, this is my order and I'll run through the order and then I got some slides. So grip, forearms, upper arm, shoulders, 
core for some torque, right? Power, you can grow through there. Hip leg thrust torque. Let's do some more of this. Let's move this more, right? Then ground pressure thrust torque. Let's actually kind of use our feet to do something more, right? So if I was to play golf, that's golf. Yay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right? Now, see what see what next slide I have here. <clears throat> gear one. Right? If you're gonna drive a car, you start in gear one, then you go to gear two, go to gear three. You definitely probably go to gear three, but you might not never get out of gear three. You might go to gear four. Then when you're on the highway cruising, you're in gear five. Okay, so gear one. <clears throat> Grip in the club in the fingers. Right? Now, it doesn't really matter. As long as you're holding the thing, you go in the palm if you want, you go in the fingers if you want. But when you break it all down, gripping it in the fingers is better than gripping it in the palm, unless you're putting where you're just trying to not really use gear one. You're going to gear two and you're just kind of using your shoulders for gear two, right? So gear one is what, where we're focused. So let's put it in the fingers. Flexion extension of the forearm muscles. So everybody take your one arm, <coughs> put it out in front of you. Okay, hinge it toward you. Okay, now keep hinging it. Watch what happens to your fingers as you go all the way in. Okay, that pinky finger comes in further Right, so this muscle in your forearm, the one that bulges up right here, that has shortened. So a quick kinesiology lesson, this is referred to the prime mover in that movement pattern, that's the agonist. And then the muscle on the back, right, you have a flexor and an extensor, the one on the back is relaxing at this point. Right, so your forearm muscle tightens. This one has to relax. If both of them are tight, this one can't do its job this way, and this one definitely can't do its job that way. So there has to be, and the brain is crazy, right? The neurosystem, how quickly does one muscle go from, I'm gonna be the prime mover, boom, you relax, and then you flex, and you relax, right? So when you go the other way, this muscle is now relaxed, right? Another great one up here in the, the bicep, prime mover agonist muscle, right? This one's just got shorter. The belly of that muscle got shorter. What the one on the back do? It's loose. Your triceps loose. Now, you can flex both of them. Like if I had to hold something up here, I've got both of them somewhat tight because I'm trying to not let that movement happen. But if I go boom, bicep, prime mover, agonist, antagonist is loose. So basic biomechanics, kinesiology, there's pushes and pulls and that's about it, right? So that's kind of where we understand the system is based on kind of what the body is actually capable of doing. All right, zero barrel roll, minimal rate of opening and closing. Now, you can, this is what I call the barrel, you can open and you can close and hit a golf ball. That, that, that type of movement and that was a, kind of a classic way that the golf swing was really taught, toe up to toe up, right? Well, it, it's great, it works. Tiger does it well, right? So at the moment of impact, if you can time all that up and square all that up, you can go from open to close and time it up. But what about if you didn't go from open to close in a barrel roll, what about if you went like this, right? So you guys know where I'm going with this? Who's, who's, in, who's in which camp? Who's in the open and closed camp? And who's in the square to square camp? Anybody? So square to square, raise your hand. <clears throat> kind of a little bit rolling open and closed. Who's in that? Who, who believes that more in that way? Okay, right? So it really doesn't really matter, except I feel that <clears throat> one is harder to be consistent at than the other. Now, when we used to swing slower because we were using a persimmon driver and a ballotta ball, and the spin rate was so high that you had to just kind of swing a lot smoother just to kind of square it up, 
the way your muscles and your body work, that was you were capable of doing that. But nowadays, when the spin rate on the driver is so minimal, the golf ball spins so little, you can literally swing out of your shoes with your eyes closed, and the equipment is so perfectly designed that it's gonna go straight most of the time. So because of that, if you're able to actually operate this muscle system well, this is a big, strong muscle, right? So if I was to take, take my wrist back here and pull it inward, right? Turn to, a, turn to a, a, a friend and shake their hand. Everybody turn to someone and shake their hand. Shake hands, everybody find someone. Keep your hands shaking. Yep, okay, now what I want you to do is twist. Now do a little arm wrestle against each other. Someone tried to stop the other person, right? Now, now what I want you to do is do this, right? Which one do you feel stronger in, right? Now, if you have an arm wrestle motion, right? What happens when you arm wrestle? Do it again. Now, kind of let one person win. So arm wrestle all over. Keep uh, twisting, sorry, twisting. Twisting, 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 twisting. What happens is that person starts to engage their shoulder when they roll. So when you're trying to teach somebody to not leave the face wide open, but yet your option is to roll it over, what ends up happening is that rotation gets all the way up into the shoulder. And if they're fighting really, really hard, then that shoulder comes up and out of it. Now, what about if you taught them to square the face this way? So when you shake hands and you're moving your forearms back and forth this way, that right shoulder can stay lower because the hand can do this. If this is trying to rotate, it, see what's happening to my shoulder, my arm up here. So if we break this down into its simplest form, and I was a one-handed golfer, and all, and, and like I said, golf is take, stick, whack, ball. If I was to take, stick, whack, ball, this way, or this way, which one am I gonna be more consistent at replicating? I don't, I, I, I don't think there's an argument, right? Now, based on your own athletic ability, you can figure it out. Like you can figure out, I can take this, open it up, roll it over, and somehow get it to square. But I can just, based on my own life and my own experience, which is all I'm talking about, this movement pattern is better. I used to do the other one. That's how I saw it, toe up, toe up, right? My, one of my old golf coaches was like, Pay me, you know, roll that hand open. <laughs> this how this this how this how you make money. Roll it pay me. That's what he kept saying, pay me. I was like, okay, pay me. But at some point during that 115 mile an hour club head speed on the driver, it pay me paid me right and paid me left. It didn't keep me consistent. But if this wrist was doing this now and this hand was doing this, I started to look deeper and deeper and deeper into it. Why? Well, because you have an agonist muscle and an antagonist muscle, when you pull one back and then flex it the other way, it's a lot easier to do this with this part of your body, okay? So that's gear one. This is how gear one works, All right? If you're doing it left-handed, it's the same muscle system. It's just on the, on the back side, right? This muscle system's going this way. So the lead thumb, if you're righty, the lead thumb does have a little bit more hinge this way than it does this way, right? Because if I was again gonna be a left-handed, one-hand ball whacker guy, when I go back here, which is interesting how most beginners that we see kind of naturally kind of get to this point, and then we coach them out of it and we teach them here, right? The truth of it is though, if I was to stand here and hold my wrist like this, just with one hand for any length of time, I can't do it. Right? This muscle over here is just not strong enough to hold that, it's gonna flop, it's gonna actually cause injury in that left thumb. So when you support the weight of the club underneath your left thumb and it hinges back this way, when you backhand it that way, it does come from under the shaft, but when it goes through, it doesn't go here and then flip over to the other side. It goes from under to backhand it and actually finishes over here. So when you see the club face coming through and kind of cupping up into the air afterwards this way, that's actually the best way to keep that club face square and consistent 
rather than going from here and rotating. So if I was the one hand golf ball whacker guy, I would figure out that this is okay, but it kind of hurts a little bit and it's a little bit labor intensive on that thumb. So if I just hinge it this way, but then I kind of whack it that way, I can figure out how to get that face a little bit more square rather than going from here and having to flip it completely all the way over, okay? Trail hand is this way. Okay, upper arm, chest, shoulders, back. So now we're gonna go from the one-handed, wristy, kind of this, like chipping. You can chip this way if you want. All right, so where's my chipper? So we're gonna move from the wrist to the shoulders. So if I'm standing here and I kind of, just kind of do like that, the club face is staying relatively square the entire time. And all I'm doing, Going, kind of doing that. I'm not having to open and close it. So now I want to add more power. Where do I go? I go to gear two. So if I go to gear two, then instead of just doing it right here in front of me with my wrist, mm -hmm. I'm now going to raise my arms up and swing them through. So if I'm on my knees, like in my trick shot show, that little club's actually the one I was just demonstrating with. So might as well demonstrate like that. So been working on my low rights, Terry, so. Okay, so if I'm in here, you got TrackMan turned on? <laughs> this is the shot you wanna track? No, I just wanna, <laughs> I just wanna know how far it goes. I'm gonna go for that green. All right, so I, do, I clearly don't have, clearly don't have the power kind of coming out of my legs yet, right? So if I, is it on? Okay, so if, <laughs> So if I raise my arm, if I just do this, right, did it get it? Beep. Yep. That's my wrist. How far? Nine yards. Nine yards in the air. 14. 15. Okay, close enough. Okay, then I'm gonna raise my arms up. Ooh, 40. 40. Ooh. 70. 60? 71. Right? So, how much of my ground reaction forces <laughs> was I leveraging to do that? All right? So when we're talking about beginner golfers, how much pushing, thrusting, rotating, core leverage was I using? So I'm dealing with a beginner golfer. I'm gonna teach them gear one, then I'm gonna work them up into gear two. So what that looks like, thanks, if you wanna sit, you know, I might call on you here and again. So if I just go arm swing from the stance, you tell me how much leg action I've got going on here. Little topper. Three. Ooh, trying too hard. I'll just do easy. Thin. How far did that one go? The last one was 121. What was that one? That was pretty good. 130. Okay. So how much rotation, leg action am I doing? The brain and the body are so great that there's something going on in there that you can't undo. But as a golfer, and you're focusing your effort on something in your swing, if you start sending the information from your brain to your hips, to your legs, to your feet before sending it to your hands, to your shoulders and down, you're gonna miss out on something, okay? So if we look at this, we have the movement of the club back and away. The club's on the ground, it's being held there, gravity's holding it there body pushes and pulls. I have to pull the club off the ground. So a great tool I found at Walmart is this Intech swing trainer. Aaron, stand up and feel that. Super heavy, right? It's basically a solid piece of steel 
um, in the shaft. So if you think about um, your your kids, your junior golfers, your beginners, they don't they don't know how to wield this thing yet. They don't know how to move it. Sometimes it can feel that heavy to someone. I think one of the bigger disservices that we do for our kids and beginners is we start throwing them into super lightweight clubs right away because then it's like, oh, they don't know how to engage with the momentum of the tool. They don't know how to swing the weight, right? I'll take that back. So when gravity is holding the club on the ground, your, your body, your arms have to lift it off the ground, right? So I take the club back to here, right? What am I doing? I'm lifting. My muscles are pulling. Now what happens when they get to here? And maybe it does this. Okay, now I have to push, right? It's like picking up a weight. You pull to about your midline, and you push beyond that. So your body's pushing and pulling. So you lift the club up, and then if you don't keep if you don't push the other way, it'll come back down so you hold it up. So what you're doing with your arms and shoulders is you're creating this, right? So I like to always do this demonstration with my students. <clears throat> Take a ball, throw it into the ground, right? That's my gear one, right? Gear two. Right? I didn't do anything necessarily here. I created force going from gear one to gear two. So everybody stand up. <clears throat> this row definitely take a step forward, big step forward. Everybody turn that way. Okay, all right. So from right here, just slap your thighs just with your hands. Hit and hold. Okay, just tap. Loosen your shoulders. Tap, 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 tap. How quickly can you tap? Now, do you tap like this? Or do you tap like this? Who tapped this way? One, two. Who taps like this? Together, right? Okay, now. That means something later on, but let's keep going with this. Relax everything. All right? Let's go harder. Now hit and hold. Where did all that, where'd you feel it? it? Gets up here, right? This can stay in your forearms. Go a little wider. Okay, now find a partner. So just turn, find a partner. Okay, uh, Michael, come over here. You can be my partner since you're best dressed for the video. All right, so put your arms out like this. All right, one person, pick, pick, a, pick a person, just put your arms out like this. Okay, the other person who's your partner, what you're gonna do, turn this way. Uh, turn, face the camera, yep. So now what he's gonna do is he's gonna push against my hand. So just this way. I'm blocking the camera, sorry. Right, so just put your, put, your, put your hand up there and have them kind of work their wrist. Right, where does, what, what muscle group is that? It's that forearm that we were just talking about, right? <laughs> now, put your hand down a little lower, right here. Now hold it this way. Now I want you to pull down. I'm gonna create resistance, pull hard, pull hard, pull hard. What muscle is that? Where, do you, where are you feeling that? Right, shoulder. Now go like this, bend the elbow in. Put the arm underneath the elbow. Okay, now have person with the elbow up. Give me an elbow pull down. Where is that? It's actually down here in your lats. Right, it's like a lat pull down. Okay, so if Michael's gonna just smack me on top of the head, with all his force, it's gonna be kind of a whipping motion. He's gonna start here, he's gonna elbow, right? He's gonna drop an elbow. Then after he drops an elbow, 
his tricep muscle is going to extend. Simultaneously, this muscle is going to go whack, right? So we don't need to hit each other. But now we started here, right? If you really want to give yourself a bruise, right? If you go up with your arms straight out, you've lost the angular momentum part of it. You create an angle, elbow down, tricep out, finger slept, when we right? So you feel it, right? Right, so just think of like if you're trying to swim, you know, like there's a movement pattern to that, but what you're doing is you're, thank you. So you're, what you're doing is you're taking that sequence and you're going basically from your triceps, right? And there's so many other muscles, but we're gonna quote, no, triceps last. Just gonna talk about the big ones. Tricep, prime mover, right? Lat, latissimus dorsi, prime mover, tricep, prime mover, forearm muscle, which has a cool name that I forgot, prime mover, right? So boom, boom, boom. That's right-handed golfer, right? If I'm gonna add that velocity, can I have a seat? If I'm gonna add that velocity, to that swing without using pretty much anything else. I'm gonna raise the club up to a place where I can now sequence that. I can go lats, triceps, forearms, right? So if I go lats, lats, triceps, forearms, all in one motion, that's what it looks like. Lats, triceps, forearms going in that direction, right? So we've just identified what the prime mover muscle systems are in gear two. We haven't even got to gear three and four. All right, one more. Got your track man ready? Might even have to put my glove on. All right, nothing lower. I like that one. How far did I go? 146. 146 at Salt Lake Salt. Elevation. Pitching wedge, it's not too shabby, right? My stock pitching wedge here is 155. If I really wanna jump on one, maybe it gets to 160. Anybody got a calculator handy? Someone got a phone with a calculator? Aaron, you got it? You got 110% in that thing? All right, well, it's 146 divided by 155. 0.941? 0 0.941. 94% of my total yardage just came out of gear one and two. So what does that leave, not using Aaron's math, what does that leave for gears Six. three, four, and five? Six percent. Okay, so if you're working on your hip rotation and your ground reaction force maneuvers to create all of that in that whipping motion, good for you. You will probably gain six more percent. <laughs> and if you really work on it hard like I have, your six percent will start going this way. Because the further away you send that message from your brain to your feet, the further away you are from actually accomplishing 94% of what you're trying to do. Now, if I backed off my 94% there, that was a pretty aggressive swing. And I said, you know what? I don't want to hit my pitching wedge 146. That's too much. And I lose a little control. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to settle for 140 or 135 on a pitching wedge. That would be a very acceptable pitching wedge, right? And... I could probably figure out how to have a little flow, a little consistency, and maybe even be able to figure out how to draw, how to hit a fade, because I'm not exerting 100% of my effort to hit my 140, right? Next. Okay. This little guy is a uh, right arm amputee. Tommy, I think his name is. He, I met him at the PGA Merchandise Show, and his uh, family, connected with a company out of Scotland and they created golfing, this little 
super, super lightweight clubs. Well, he only, has, he only has one arm and he only has his lead arm. He chose that, right? So if I'm doing this hammer down, boom, 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 honestly, it's easier, right? For a right-handed golfer to leverage it going in this direction. It's harder, it's still possible to use the same muscle system, but you're doing it kind of that way, right? Now, how strong is he in his gear one and two? Not as strong as me. So he can't stand there and go gear one, two, boom, 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 got it. Craig's a genius. He has to figure out on his own, and nobody taught him how to do this. He's a one-handed, one-armed golfer. But basically what he did is he took his hand and he set the club, and they created a super lightweight club, probably because a standard weight club was doing doing this to his wrist, right? But once he set it here over his shoulder, he spins his body, and that's how he hits it. He basically creates like a whipping action of movement through his hips, legs, and feet, and he drags it through and he does it, right? So now you can go gear one, two, or you can, if you don't have gear one, two, you can leverage gear three, which is the rotation of the, the core, and create rotational force, okay? Now the thing about golf is that rotation, right? So centrifugal force is an aligning force. Gravity is an aligning force. This is aligning with gravity, just holding it here. Centrifugal force aligns, right, based on that. So if I just start spinning, make myself dizzy. Look at how consistently that, whew, all right, look at how consistently that flew. On the same plane, path, whatever you want to call it, plane or path, but it moved in a consistent manner. And I didn't really do anything other than just try to not do this, right, as I was going through that space. So what he's able to do, because he's using more centrifugal force, is rotation creates that centrifugal force, right? So the weight of this end flings out and creates a circle. As it creates a circle, he can then balance that and figure out how to stand, how to rotate, so that when he rotates, he can have some form of consistency, okay? Now, because we play golf with the ball on the ground, your lie angles of your equipment and the way we stand and play has something to do with this. A standard like lob wedge is 64 degree lie angle, and a standard driver is about 57 degree lie angle, right? So if we say, okay, this is zero, we're gonna come up to 45, that would be an equal balance of both up, down, and round and around. Zero would be all round and around, right? So if I put a T up here, I could spin, boom. All rotation, I don't have to do anything, I can relax my hands and arms, I can just simply rotate from a stance like this, boom, and I can hit a ball off of a high T. That's all, I can do that with all rotation. Now, because we go from zero to 45, and then we add another eight degrees just to get to the driver, and then we add another seven degrees to get to our wedge, we're operating in the zone that is more in the up down than the round and around, okay? So, if I do gear one and two, this is up down. If I add gear three, I've now added more round and round. So this is where a lot of problems can kick in. If you're spinning while trying to go up down, that's like taking your arm and doing this and then trying to like spin your hips at the same time. Now eventually what happens is this thing here starts to, instead of staying here, it starts to kind of round out, right? So in my opinion, when you get into gear three, gear three for me, which is kind of like core hips, is adding rotation, but not necessarily for thrust and for power, but for just range of motion. So if I were to do gear one on this angle, and then I added gear two, what the hips do for me is as the hips turn me back, they kind of flatten out my plane a little bit and give me more range. So if I'm capable of here on gear two, if I add gear three, I just added more length to my backswing. Now the potential is there for me to add rotational force, but 
that can backfire. If I start rotating too, too hard, too fast, and using the rotation as power and not placement, that's gonna cause problems. You spin out of it, your arms can't catch up, they can't sink back up. So when I break down my swing, I think, okay, my hands and arms are gonna add all the speed. My hips are gonna just create an additional range of motion. Because if I get to the top of my swing here and I start doing this to create additional speed, I just lost the consistency that I have in my 94% to gain what? Two, three more percent. So in a 300 yard drive, 1% is three yards, 2% six. Why, 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 why do I wanna hit at 306 and possibly crooked when I can hit it 300 and straight. Okay, next. Here four, <clears throat> we're getting into the big muscles. One of my biggest pet peeves is, oh, yo, you have such big quads and hamstrings. You should be so powerful and hit the ball so far. I'm not hitting it with your quads and your hamstrings, right? If I could take this and adhere it to my belt, Let's tee it up. Let's go. <laughs> Let's do this thing. All right. In an after hours crowd, I'd be getting all kinds of comments about right now. But let's go. I got you, right? There's no way you can outdrive me. All right. Enough said on that. Although I did want to point out Tiger's swing. It's pretty cool. This was him practicing um, at, at Tulsa for the PGA. One thing I wanted to point out here was if you can see like the bill of his cap and address, you can see where the grass line is. And then you can see he's already gone on the top of his backswing and now he's here, you can see the bill of his cap. Standard bill of the cap is 5.78 inches. Just, yeah, just joking, but whatever that is, <laughs> dropped to here and then back up. So he is creating some of that with his legs, right? There's no disputing that, but what's actually moving? Is it really this? Or is it a little bit of this? Or is it his spine, right, doing this? So many things that affect that, but when we stop and we look at pictures, a lot of times we start thinking about, oh, look, he squatted so much more. Look at his knee flex here compared to there. There is some movement, but it's not all of that. Okay, next. Right, we all know that's Justin Thomas. Okay, he's on his tippy toes. We know Bubba Watson's on tippy toes. Lexi Thompson, right? You can think of players that are on their tippy toes. Okay, one of the coolest things that ever happened was when he won the PGA Championship and he was being interviewed, they had him and his dad there and they asked him, Justin Thomas, you leverage the ground so much. You spring off, you, you, you use the ground forces so well. Is that why somebody who's you know, not big in stature like yourself hits it so far? And he goes, huh? And they're like, didn't you? And then there's an interview and you can find it on YouTube. Is that something that you and your dad worked on to create all that force and speed? He's like, huh? And he asks Mike Thomas, his dad, no. I don't work on any of that stuff, it's just what he did. Okay, so here's my theory on why. As a little kid, right? Okay, this is relative for a little kid, the weight of this thing, right? If I take this and I, oh my gosh, dad, don't make me hit any more balls. <laughs> Having like trauma flashback, lift it up in the air, right? Oh, my hands hurt, my arms hurt, it's pulling me down. Just hit it, Craig, hit as hard as you can. Vroom. What's gonna happen to this thing? All right, it's gonna completely smash into the ground. Maybe this is too long proportionate to my body. What happens when I throw this thing down? Don't hit the ground. Just about cramp my calf muscles doing that. Right, this thing's moving and it's coming down. And he, like all of us, are trying to hit it as hard as we can. The force of this thing is flying down into the ground. How do we not take out a 12-inch divot? Right? 
come off of the ground. So those that swing hard at it and get up on their toes and spin out, like coming through and doing that, all of this down here, there's two ways that this influences and has movement. One is off the ground, the ground reaction force. I have to push into the ground to jump. But this down here is just as much a club reaction force as it is a ground reaction force. As this thing starts flying around, instead of the club going like this and pulling me, as I get to here, I have to push back so the club doesn't push me around, so I can keep my head behind the ball or whatever it is I'm working on. So when you look at long drivers now, they get set up, they pull back like this, they kind of stomp into the ground here, but that's just to kind of get their body in a place where they can push. Because there's centrifugal force, which is outward force, and then there's centripetal, with a P, that's the equal and opposite force that's in balance, right? So as I swing a club, the centrifugal force, the centrifuge, the heaviness is pulling out. If I just let go, centrifugal force pulls it and lets it go. What I have to do as the athlete is to equally and oppositely balance the centrifugal force that I'm throwing with centripetal balance, right? So as the club's flying around, I have to balance it. So when somebody's fully capable of thrusting centrifugal force at a really high rate, but they don't have any consistency to their swing, they haven't trained the centripetal balance to that force. They can throw it out, they just can't sustain it and balance it in a nice circle, okay? So the foot action, I think, is a byproduct of throwing the club down and through and back up, and that's just more of an educated guess on my part based on the biomechanics that I understand, physics, etc. right? So I'm gonna play this video for you. As I play this video for you, what I want you to do is observe these characters, okay? Four guys are about to pound a massive stake into the asphalt. They're erecting a huge tent. I've watched it in person. You know, when somebody does like a circus tent or something like that, observe. And as you watch these four, I want you to tell me based on their movement patterns, who is the more athletic and better than that, who could do this the rest of the day without being tired? This is stake one, they got 50 more stakes. Who's gonna be the most tired at the end of this and who's gonna be able to continue? <laughs> This guy goes the longest? Yeah. Which guy goes the shortest? The guy in the, the two guys in the back. These two guys? Yeah. No, no, no. Or those two guys? Those two guys, yeah. <clears throat> I had the guy in the white going all the way. I did too. Okay. <laughs> I did too. I, he had a, I the white. I got second from left. The middle will go the longest. This guy? Yeah. He's going the longest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Again, Green used less motion to pound and he hit it further into the ground than the other three guys. Yeah. The guy in the white goes like this to hit it over his head. He's wasting more energy. Okay. I thought the white guy was using momentum to get them. Yeah, right? Okay. So it's interesting, right? It's interesting how we look at it. And this would, this would also identify how we would coach 
and how and the things that we observe. You can watch the stick, the, the, the stake go into the ground. You can watch the movement patterns. The guy in the green, I'll play it again. One of the things that I thought about with this guy in the green is he's got the tent stuck behind him, right? Whereas this guy over here is freewheeling. So if he's moving the hammer and the guy behind him in the white hat, he has the fullness of the range of the motion. So he's kind of wielding the tool. So when you think about longevity and the guy going the length of the day, I think if that guy's back is to the tent all day, he's going to get worn out because he has to do like this little mini short swing, right? But he's obviously a strong guy because he's pounding, like Terry said, he's pounding the stake into the ground further, but he's actually doing it with probably not the right pattern. If he had the space of the other guy over here, then he might even be more efficient, right? Let's watch him again real quick. I'm just amazed that nobody got hurt. Watch how their body moves and their legs move. different? Yes. Yeah? The guy in the green hits the tent almost every time. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else see anything different? Yeah? The one closest to us, you, you almost feel like he's using the weight of the, the hammer, the hammer. To swing over his head. So yeah. he's not using his power to lift it. He's got to be swinging up. Yeah. It's yeah. a longer swing. Did any one, of, any one of them look like they had better form or worse form? Okay, so. They're all unique. Sam Sneed. John Rom. <laughs> right? Adam Scott. Tom Kite. Just getting it done. Just figure something out. He's, getting, he's just getting it done, right? They all get the stakes solidly. Uh, yeah. The coordination for that to happen. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. I mean, they're all on tour. Yeah. Right? They're all major champions. To not even hit it and snap the, the head off the wall. Oh, yeah. The like stake is huge. Like, you, you, you may not be able to see from there, but that stake is intact. It's not that big. Like, it's, it's only this big, but it's also still flat. Like, I bet if we put a stake in here, and when I was like, all right, give it a, give it a go, the whole thing would be, like, dented in the circles. Like, I can't even hammer a nail without, like, tipping it over that way, right? Okay. So the reason why this up here is because I want to kind of organize it. So when I created my, my Sabre golf swing trainer, it had very many uh, purposes, right? And I wanted to make sure that it did a lot of things. I wanted to make sure it had a heavy end, right? Because I wanted my students to become in tune with weight. This thing weighs two pounds, but most of the weight is out here at this end. So it's heavier than a golf club. I'll let you guys swing it uh, when we're done. But basically, if you watch me and I do this just with one arm, you can see there has to be like a give and a break and a balance. And you're thinking like, okay, boom, right? There's a wielding of the tool. The tool itself has to have a movement pattern to it that's consistent. When you start messing with that, it's like, ah, just broke my elbow, right? So there's too many times in the golf swing that our students are what I call manhandling the club, right? I played college football, right? And then they come out and then they wanna show you how powerful they are and then they hit their driver like 210 and you're like, mm. So, so wield, wield the tool, right? Like I literally had a, a guy, it's on YouTube, you can watch it on my YouTube channel. This young man came out, he played, I'm not a football guy, so, not the biggest guys on the defensive line, but the guys over here, what are they called? Like, defensive end or something like that. And he played for um, Navy. So he played for the Navy. Strong guy, came out to play and take a lesson, big guy. 
And I made the mistake of saying, oh, so what's the stance? Like, how do you get into your football? And he's like, and I was like, whoa, 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 time, time out. Like, threw him into some kind of PTSD and he was about to crush me. Like, he was about to just truck me from that stance. And I was like, wow. I was like, you're, you're, he and he is a big, strong guy. The first thing I did with him is I took him out and we have like behind my teaching tee, we have a field of grass. It's pretty, really pretty. It starts growing up native grass. So I go out there with just a, a shaft. So I take a uh, you know, grip and just a, this, uh, like a fitting shaft. And I'm like, go out there and I want you to swish the grass and cut it down, mow it down. So he starts doing this, big strong guy. That thing is whistling. I'm backing up because there's grass and stuff flying all over the place. But even as I describe that movement, what, what gears am I using primarily to swish that stick and mow down that grass, right? I'm going to get one and two, and if I'm going to get a little aggravated, I'm going to go three and create a little bit of rotation once I've created that rotation. But I'm not going to start thrusting with my legs and pushing. It's a stick. It's a very lightweight stick. I can do that. Now, if it's super heavy, like these guys are demonstrating, you have to really kind of move that weight. Boom, All right? So even here, I accidentally grabbed the light end of the saber and I couldn't feel that weight, right? So now I have it here. So as he's swinging it back, like this guy over here, he's kind of creating more of like a, kind of more of a fluid circle. And he's not really, I don't think he's working as hard. So I think this guy can go a little bit longer. This guy over here kind of has a little bit of a pause just because he has to, slide the hammer up the tent, hold it above his head for a second, and then he kind of uses his whole body, he kind of squats into it and moves it that way. So the saber's heavy, because I want my students to feel that weight in motion in that circle. The saber's light, so all the weight's at this end, at this end. When I grip it at this end, all the weight's now in my hands. So now this end appears to be very light. So as I pull it back, now I can actually accelerate gear one, right? Now, how do I do that with timing? I get to the top of my backswing. You hear the ball drop. Now the ball's dropped. Now, as I use my lats, triceps, and forearm muscles, I can create that snap. So I'm not using my hip rotation. I'm not using my legs to do that. I'm just doing that, right? So once I've uh, done that and I've created that motion, then what I'll do is I'll take the saber and I'll say, look, we want to add range to that motion. Your body needs to have some rotation to create length of backswing. You notice what I'm doing here? My head's staying not still, but my head's staying in the same place. And my feet are essentially staying on the ground. If I'm snapping and creating that speed, how consistent will I be doing this versus adding this, right? Now, if I added this at the, at the same way every single time, I'll be fine, but you don't do that. On a 50 yard pitch, you do this with your arms. On a driver, you add that a little <coughs> bit, right? Because a percent or 2% further with a driver means a little bit more than a percent or two with a short shot. So anyway, as you're wielding the tool, it's important. So there's only the tool and the body. These guys have their body and they have a tool. They're wielding the tool and they're trying. They know they got all day. They got so many more of these to do. They're going to figure it out, right? So. Any questions before we move into more of like the golf IQ side of things? Does that sound consistent, different, similar, eye-opening, revealing, maybe worth a, a thought? Right, that's, that's all I'm trying to do. I know this works for myself, and I know when I compete and play, I try to employ these things, and I don't do them great every single time. But I feel like at 47 and 5'6", I do pretty good. If you look at age, health, strength. At the Waste Management Phoenix Open that I played in January, 
My driving average was 306. My club head speed was 115. PGA Tour average is 297. Club head speed average is 114. Um, I averaged more than a PGA Tour player average in those tournaments in, in front of 20,000 people on, you know, on one hole. So I feel like I personally am on the right track and I don't feel like deviating from that. And there's a couple things that I filter this, this whole thing through and you should too. Injury prevention, sustainment under pressure. That's it. How do you move and not be injured or become healthier if your movement pattern is causing some of your injury? Right? How do I have longevity in the game? And how do I com command that movement under pressure and play at a high level? That's the only two filters that you should be filtering anything through, right? If you're not trying to make more birdies and win tournaments, then filter it 100% through injury prevention. How do I move so that I can play this game forever and not be injured? And how can I teach my students to not be injured the same way? And if you're a competitive golfer, you have two things to filter it through. One is body and the other one is pressure. Does it sustain under pressure? And that's why I switched from doing the classic toe up, changing, uh, having a, a rate of closure, a higher rate of closure, because under pressure, this left hand for me just got that much tighter. Just that much tighter. Now I could have fixed the problem by just figuring out how to not be squeezing tight at the moment of impact. But I said, if I'm gonna squeeze a little accidentally tight, I don't want rate of rotation while I'm squeezing. If I squeeze a little tight and my release pattern is more square to square release, at least the ball's coming out straight. It may not go the full distance, but at least it's coming out here. The problem with clamping down on rate of rotation or rate of closure is when you clamp down, it doesn't close. And then under pressure, you don't figure out that this is the problem, so you start trying to fix it with turning this way. You go down a bad pathway under pressure. So for me, I'm always gonna succumb to some pressure, I'm human, but if I accidentally got tight here, now I know that at least the club face is coming through straight. Um, thoughts, questions? Take a minute. Do we need another break? Anybody need to use the restroom or anything like that? We're, we're actually coming up on our time. We are? Yeah. How much time do I have? Well, we said 9 to 12, but we'll, as long as- I, I lost track. I'm like in the zone over here. It's, a, it's five minutes. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. But, I mean- I'll, I'll run through it real quick, okay? Got a funny little video, and then I'll touch on one thing for confidence, and then we'll be done. No, nope, you guys can't comment. We don't have time. <laughs> Let me find it. And if people wanted to stay here longer, I mean, there are some less. That, I'm sure guys pick your brain for what people will pick your brain yeah. for a while. Yeah. Um, <clears> okay. <throat> Mike Manning, everybody, give him a round of applause and. <laughs> Uh, we, no, we just love it when TrackMan supports us, and TrackMan is great for many different things. So I'll touch on one thing, because I brought him out here to demonstrate something, and I over-talked over everything. Hopefully you th thought it was valuable. But anyway, capturing, so how do I know that this is better? I make more birdies. How do I know my dispersion pattern's better? I use TrackMan, I hit shots in dispersion. He has, and you can talk to him about it, but Trackman has a new, what's it called? Test center. Test center. So you may be familiar with Combine, but I think Test Center is even way better than that because what it does is it starts to create a real simulation for you, the golfer, to really test whether or not you can do these things under pressure. I said filter it under pressure. How do you practice under pressure? You use the Test Center because what it does is it gives you an opportunity to put a pin in a back right hole location surrounded by bunkers and simulate what kind of shots am I gonna hit? Do I know my dispersion pattern for a 200 yard shot versus a 110 yard shot, et cetera? So if you wanna learn more about Test Center, talk to Mike about that. 
I think it's great. I'm gonna use it a lot with my students, um, especially in the indoor setting. All right, check out this video real quick. My wedge, you know, 120. Well, you might hit a 120 under certain conditions, but in the morning, ball's not gonna go 120. Maybe in the afternoon when it's warmer and the ball heats up, but it's gonna go five to 10 yards shorter in the morning. People don't factor that in. If you get a little bit of water in between the club face and the ball, people don't know, it actually increases spin, causes it to go shorter. The first cut always comes out six to eight yards dead. If the grain is into you, it's going to launch and hit lower on the face, launch lower, have more spin. Mm -hmm. If it's down grain, the club slides a little bit quicker, you'll get more out of it. If it's sitting up on zoysia or, or off of a tee, always goes five yards farther with each iron based on the fact that the center of gravity is underneath the ball and it launches higher, a little bit less spin. All these things I have to factor in when I look at the lock, my, I hit my. Okay, Dave Ferdy's looking at him going, that's why I, I'm not on tour anymore, I can't, <laughs> right? I mean, now we're in a golf IQ. Perfect example there. When you're looking at that trim five and you're trying to figure out, okay, so if you have this question, you're like, oh gosh, you know, I always putt well on bent grass. But when I go to Bermuda, I don't make any putts. Okay, anybody had that thought or vice versa? Yeah, right? It happens. Why? You don't know what you don't know. So go learn as much as you can. I've gone through book after book of agronomy, understanding root structures, the way grain works, the way the leaf grows. Is one grief in a, one leaf a different height in an A4 bent versus a standard bent? I mean, this is like Phil Mickelson going through all that stuff versus wet versus zoysia versus whatever. It's called leaving no stone unturned, right? If I wanna be better and I wanna compete at the highest level, I'm gonna flip over every single stone I come across until I find an answer that's suitable to me. So when I'm playing in a tournament and I, putting has become like my main focus because 15 years ago, I had the yips and I couldn't make a three foot putt. I was the guy that they always said, Craig is the best ball striker that's not on tour. Cause I couldn't make a putt. So I said, you know what, forget that. I'm gonna figure out everything I can about putting, which includes grasses, greens, green reading and everything else. And I'm gonna get to the bottom of it. I'm gonna make myself the best putter. So now when I look at my shot length data, I'm strokes gained on the PGA tour in putting. That that's, you know, I made it through Q school, through three stages of Q school, through the final six rounds of Q school to get a, at the time, a nationwide tour card and then a web.com card. Now the Corn Ferry Tour, right? So I got there, but the only reason I got there was because I became an awesome putter. And I'm still an awesome putter because I'm still doing the same things. But part of that was understanding grasses and greens and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So food for thought, it's called Golf IQ. Decade might make you smarter, Aaron. Look into it, right? Scott Fawcett, who, who created that whole system, I have his number if you want it. You can talk to him about it because he was so frustrated that he was one of the longest hitters in the US Open that he qualified for, but he couldn't get the ball in the hole because his mental state was, I just need to get in the fairway, chip it down the fairway when he was one of the longest hitters and he should have been bombing it over corners. <clears throat> Trying to trying to trying to use his asset. Okay? Okay, let's see what, what else I got. Confidence, right? So we'll wrap this up with confidence. Big long list, right? We can go over this. We'll have a couch session. You gotta line up after Devin. Um if you wanted to stay longer and people have to go, they could leave. Okay, Some I'm people, fine with it. I mean, you know, if you guys have a time to move in at 12, but if you want to chat about it a little longer. If you you guys want me to keep going for a bit? I mean, this is kind of a big one. Yeah. I'll keep going. And if you have to leave, just wave and and then I'll catch you later. Um, I'll throw an extra MSR point on there. Oh, sure. <laughs> That's worth it. Um, okay. And I didn't even hit really any trick shots, so. Um, okay. Confidence. Okay. I had confidence that Annie was gonna show up and let me in the building. Right? I, what's another word for that? Trusted that she was gonna do that, or somebody was gonna be here, right, to let me in. So when 
Weston was going to be here. He's the one that flipped the lights on. He was out mowing greens when I got here. He's doing everything. Um, confidence is just another word for trust. Okay? So when you have lost confidence, you've lost trust. Now, funnel it through those five, well, four, the other four ones. What have you lost trust in? Have you lost trust in your equipment? Have you lost trust in your skill? Have you lost trust in your body? That was a big one for me a couple years ago. I was like, gosh, if I'm gonna try to play in any of these PGAs or PGA Tour events, I gotta at least be able to walk, right? So I've lost a belt size, I've, I've lost probably 10 pounds, but I'm converting that into muscle. But the main thing for me is my belt looks better, so when now when I, I'm on TV and if I get a picture taken of me, it's, I don't have my belly sticking out like this, I can at least look a little bit trimmer. But the main thing is sustainability for me to be able to have the, have the stamina to actually walk, right? I have, I'm blessed with good feet. I don't get blisters. I'm blessed with good knees and, and hips. I don't get worn out. But that's, you can't take that stuff for granted. I could feel my knees getting a little bit more, uh, having a little bit more strain on them because I was carrying more body weight and I wasn't getting out there and doing it, right? So I lost trust in my physical part. Golf IQ. Ben Faraday looks like he lost trust in all of his golf IQ, <laughs> right? After listening to Mickelson, he's like, I don't know any of that stuff, right? Or he's probably thinking, wow, that's way over the top and that's crazy. But for Mickelson's, for Mickelson's perspective and my perspective is this, he's just, leaving nothing, no stone unturned, right? He's just trying to figure out exactly what he needs to focus on. And it all happens like that. I played with Arter yesterday and he's like, wow, it was so good to actually play with you in a tournament. Because when I play with the guys at Glenwild, I'm just out working on stuff. Like I got my list of things I'm working on when I play with them. I might make a few birdies and make a few bogeys. And they look at me and they're like, how can this guy qualify for a major championship or hold his own in a PGA Tour event when I can at least tie him for nine holes at Glenwald? How, what's the separation, right? But what they don't realize is I'm not, I'm not the same person. I'm out over here working on stuff at Glenwild. I'm not focused, whereas Arter actually got to see me in matches and see me hit certain shots. And the point that he made was you just go through it differently. You look at the shot differently. He's like, I could stand there watching you go through your shot and you could see the wheels turning in your head as to what you were trying to figure out. And he's like, that's what I need to learn. I, I get, all he gets is distance and maybe wind direction and lie, but he's not factoring in the leave. He's not factoring in the miss. He's not factoring in all those things. Well, how can you factor, uh, focus on one thing if you're stressed on another, right? So he also was struggling tremendously with his putting. We got him a different putter, and now he has way more confidence that the ball's actually gonna get to the hole with some consistency. Well, he told me yesterday, well, this is so great that the ball's doing what I want, and I'm starting it online now. Now I can focus on green reading. Boom, revelation, new thing, right? That's gone, now you change your focus. So when you, don't have confidence, you've lost confidence in something, and you've lost trust in something, right? So when you're looking at this, you, you kind of have to go through uh, kind of an inventory of what it is, right? So a couple of questions for you. Confidence in what or how, right? So what comes first? Proving out your process or believing you're the best? When I was having the yips, I read everything I could from Stockton to Crenshaw, read everything I could about green reading, putter fitting, did the whole thing, put it into process, worked it out. And one of the things I told myself is I am the best putter in the world. I do not suck anymore at putting, I'm the best. And the reason why, one of the reasons why I'm the best is because I left no stone unturned and I figured it out. And I even went so far as to start making my own putters because your standard putter, and I'll give, give you a quick little sales pitch on my putter. Every putter on the market has a rounded sole to the bottom, and this is just a really, really simple point, right? You wonder, why are putters rounded? I don't know. Nobody has that answer. Okay? 
So if nobody knows the answer, why are putters rounded? I can tell you why they shouldn't be rounded. Who in here has had a custom putter fitting? Raise your hand. Name, right? Why angle is important. Okay, with a rounded sole of a putter, you can set the putter on the heel or the toe and you will be one, two, three degrees off of your lie angle that the best putter fitter you know prescribed for you. So on Monday, you're dead on. Tuesday, you're toe to, to down. Wednesday, you're heel down. Thursday, you're back on track and you're changing by one degree. Now look at what happens to the handle at that end, right? Let's see, I put it right here. Okay, this has a flat sole. On this piece of plastic, you hear that? That's me going heel, toe, heel, toe. That's me finding dead flat. Now in my putter, as you can see from there, I have forward shaft lean. You can see it's the same forward shaft lean. If I go like this, that's me going front back, front back. How do I know it's sold? It's flat. Anybody can figure that out. You ever take a glass and sit it on your table crooked and let it fall over and spill water? No, you don't. You take the glass and you put the, the bottom of the glass right on the table, boom, flat. Then you let go of it because you have confidence that it's there. This putter, when I plop it down, is the same every time. Rounded soles, look at this. All right. How far is that handle moving? You can see it. That's like ready for one degree. How far is that grip end moving? Inch or more. Let's go two degrees. Right? So if you're setting your putter down and it's a one day of the week, you're like, boom, making everything. What happens if the handle moves an inch? Right? What happens to your eye line if the handle's moving an inch? That's why I make putters with flat soles. So now you're all sold. <laughs> sold. Okay, so leave no stone unturned. Create a process, buy into the process, and then tell yourself you're the best at whatever it is. Um, you have to do a little bit of soul searching, go through some stuff. I got some videos that I was going to show. There we go. Star Wars reference. Um, I'm going to show you one last video, then we'll call it quits. Okay, so this is just kind of like power of the mind stuff. Okay. Hired to fix a refrigerated box car in back of a train. He goes into the train, he panics, gets himself locked inside the box car. So now he's pounding on the door, there's nothing to do. He starts to panic and thinks he's gonna to freeze to death. He finds a pen, he starts writing down, Tom, what's going through his mind, and he writes down, I'm becoming colder. As people, one of the things we do to ourselves is observe and report. I'm not playing well, I'm having a bad day, we're having a bad quarter, my marriage isn't going well. We observe and report. Still colder now, he writes, nothing to do but wait. Half asleep, I could hardly write. Finally, he says, these might be my last words. And I'll show you the article. They open up the boxcar many hours later and they find him and he's dead. But the temperature inside the boxcar was 56 degrees. The freezing apparatus was broken. There was plenty of air in the boxcar. There was no physical reason for his death. The best they could say is somehow he talked himself into dying. Pretty extreme example. Right? <laughs> Poor guy talked himself into dying. Why was he there? Why was he there? He was there to fix the boxcar. He was there to fix the refrigeration of the boxcar. He went there to fix something that was broken. He just threw it in. He, he didn't have an emergency response protocol. He didn't know how to properly do that. If in his toolbox of stuff he had a a temperature gauge, a thermometer, and he just popped that thing open and looked at it, he'd be like, well, I guess I'll just hang out in here and watch some uh, YouTube TV for a while, you know, whatever. Like, he wouldn't have freaked himself out to the point where he felt like he had to document his own death as he was 
feeling colder and colder and colder. He actually went there to fix the thing that he freaked himself out about, right? So last part, when you're dealing with the stresses and strains of life and you're dealing with that confidence and you're losing trust in one thing or another, yes, you need to go through your trim five, identify the percentage worth of effort and focus on that percentage of effort and try to improve that. And don't try to eat the whole elephant in one bite, bite it off you know, one piece at a time. The, the one very important part of that is you have to have this type of a system because this 